Welcome to Cross Platform Podcast, where we discuss how to solve productivity problems across platforms. I'm Augusto Pinot. And I'm Mark Gelwix. And today, rings, bling, things. <laughs> what is our topic today? <laughs> well, I was I was trying to be a little witty with the title, and it's rings, bling, and doing things. And with the recent unpacked event and other discussions that are going on about secondary devices and, and uh, auxiliary devices such as watches and rings. I was curious to get your thoughts on where you think they fit in the entire scape or landscape of productivity and what their value is and are they worth the investment of time and, and money? Just well, figured this is a good opportunity to kick it around. Right. And you know, we're discussing into for me the watch. Okay, let's just start with the watch. Okay. Okay. I have I use the Apple Watch. I live on the Apple ecosystem. I have I did not buy the first generation. Uh the first one I have was the third generation. And then was later upgraded by the eighth generation. And the reason of the upgrade was I, um, my third generation was declared uh, obsolete. Therefore, I went and bought the next one. Do I can get rid of other devices and just keep the watch? No. Uh, I have considered buying the watch with data. My watch do not have data. So I can not carry my cell phone. Okay. But I now carry the cell phone for other reasons. So is that means the cell phone will come, then there is no reason for me to have a watch with data. If you tell me right now, or you ask me right now, if you're watch die will you replace it without a doubt the answer is yes what is the reason your watch is quote unquote indispensable none and that's for me the problem the watch give me very micro things that are very convenient but none of them per se are a reason to buy or upgrade this product. Yeah, it gave me a visualize of the calendar. It gave me an alert on the calendar, allows me to do timers. Are that indispensable? No. It is cool? Yeah. Yeah, when I'm driving, it vibrates when I need to turn left and right so I can turn in the opposite direction. Okay. Not because of the watch, just because <laughs> I'm direction challenge. Okay. But all of that will make my watch indispensable. Probably not. And probably as other devices, I will make a lot more effort to replace if I found that I can't replace the iPhone immediately. Well, I will go put battery on one of my old watches and go on. I have a watch that has, you know, the motion battery. So that thing just need to get some motion and I will be good. Phone anyways is in my pocket all the time. So I don't know. Um, from the fitness perspective, I love that feature of the watch. I love that I can get into the Peloton machine and it will track it. I love that if I'm doing an especially long walk, the watch will tell me, hey, looks like you are walking or do you want to track this? Those things I like. For certain people, okay, and I have a friend who his father has um, atrial fibrillation, okay, that it's a different thing on the watch. Okay, why? Because what happened is when that happened, his father can lose conscious and if lose conscious can fail. Okay. So that's where the watch shine. 
Okay. And in his case, his father has the latest watch every time a new one comes out. Why? Because now that's a medical device. It's not a nice to have device. For me, the watch is still on the nice to have. So comes the rings. And understanding that this is a device that is mostly fitness in my perspective, okay, is the ring make more sense than the watch? And it's been a question that I have formulated multiple times. Should I get rid of my Apple Watch and, you know, pull one of my nice watches that I had before? Maybe they're not that nice, but they were nice for me. Okay. <laughs> and buy me a ring. And that was a question that I did when I upgrade to the current version of my Apple Watch. When my Apple Watch 3 was obsolete, I asked. And what I did was I took the watch you know, off and I spent two or three days. Okay. I like the alerts. I, but, but again, can I live without the alerts? Yes, I can live without the alert. I just enjoy them very much. So what I like about this is not everybody is willing to let the fancy watch out. And by fancy, I don't necessarily mean there is people, you know, when when before the Apple Watch, I had three watches, okay? And I really enjoy waking up in the morning, looking at the watch and making another decision, okay? I don't understand why, but it was something that I enjoy, okay? And even that's part of the reason the exchange of the bands for the watch is so popular. Okay, because yes, you cannot change the watch, but now you can put leather, you can put different kinds and get a similar feeling of I'm not wearing the same thing every day. So if you want to wear those fancier watches, okay, one of the things that you don't have yet is how to make that fancier watch interact with the rest of your electronic life. So will be very interesting to see what maybe not with this generation, but the next generation bring into those things. Can you give me the alert in the finger? Yes or no. Can, what can you give me health wise, fitness wise, that makes sense in the finger? And then I can go back to a different kind of watch. Even in your case, and you can share the story. I hope you do. Uh, you experience something with the watch. So mm -hmm. for you, this thinking process was recent. So what was your, tell your story on the thinking process. So, so for me, I, I want to split this up a little bit. Um, okay. I view this type of tech in two categories, active, pro actively productive and passively productive. The ones that will actually provide you features and functions that extend what you're, you're doing already and the other ones that are gathering data to help you be productive in more subtle ways. So I've been using smartwatches forever, all the way back to when you would mm -hmm. load the old Timex using an infrared reader. I mean, that's way back in the day. So I had for quite a while a Samsung Galaxy Watch 4 with the rotating bezel and everything. Looked very nice, worked very well, lasted a long, long time finally died so i had a choice i'm like okay do i replace it with the latest and greatest this was probably about a month ago well before the release information on the watch 7 which literally just was released yesterday um, or should be hitting the market on the 24th or do i look at an alternative do i look at a really powerful fitness type of watch something like a fitbit and the primary factor driving that decision was battery life and i think that's one of the key markers for any of this technology uh, if you're spending a lot of time charging it if you can't trust it to get through a full day or a full 24 hour mm -hmm. period it can become a difficult piece of tech to integrate integrate in your day-to-day -day life uh, especially if you leverage 
some of the capabilities that they tout, such as sleep tracking, which I do. If you're using sleep tracking, you can't charge it overnight. So you have to pick a time period that you're going to not really need it and use it. So when I look at things like a smartwatch versus a ring versus whatever, um, is it a crucial piece of technology? Absolutely not. Is it a valuable piece of technology? It can if you integrate it into your, your methods and your systems properly. I think the ring to me, and this is where I will struggle, it, struggle with it, is about as passive a piece of equipment as you can integrate in. Doesn't matter, even if they do a vibrate on it, and, and I'll use a parallel to that. You were talking about other watches. Skagen for a while had a hybrid mechanical watch. Uh, I actually have it. It's fairly thick. It uses a large 2032 replaceable battery that lasts about two weeks. So you have to keep mm -hmm. swapping out these batteries. But it was all mechanical action. But it could do things like it had a Bluetooth connection. So it could take and give you a notification that you received a notification. Uh, it could track your steps. It could pass information to the phone. Very attractive watch. But it was one of those where it's like, Okay, here's here again goes back to that challenge. It's not a rechargeable watch, so you're literally throwing away batteries every two weeks, and they're they're those button batteries, so they're not the cheapest things on the planet. It did its jobs, but when you start to cross that line from passive productivity into active, and personally, I consider notifications active productivity because it, the watch is telling you something. The device is telling you it's something. It's not just sitting there and monitoring the entire time. When it's passing information back to you, that information has to be useful. So something like the Skagen watch, it could only vibrate to say, hey, you have a notification. And then through an interesting bit of engineering, you could define on the watch face what the position of the hands would be referring to. So for example, if I got a text message, the hands on the watch would go right to the 12 position for about 10 seconds and then drop back to whatever the actual time was. Uh, if I got a notification from Instagram, they would go to the three position and so forth, so forth and so on. So you could set that up in that mechanical design. Now on a regular smartwatch, you can just pass the notification through, you can respond back, so I don't think anything that is designed with the to be as unobtrusive as possible, thereby blending in the passive productivity space, is ever going to be able to get past the, it's just kind of there. Even if it were to do a notification, you still have to pull your device out and look at it and, and find out what that thing is. And at that point, honestly, is it really much better than it just vibrating in your back pocket? Oh. The idea of utilizing a watch with like an LTE connection, minimizing the amount that you have your phone with you. Again, I get it. Uh, until they get the battery life better on these things, it's going to be a struggle because something like an LTE connection, you're going to burn through your battery in a day. And almost all of them have that challenge. Uh, so what did I wind up doing? I, mean, I had my dead uh, watch for. I purchased a Sense 2 Fitbit. What intrigued me about it is they tout the fact that it has a six-day battery life. Like, oh, okay, this should be interesting. Functionally, doesn't look bad. Different screens. It can take notifications. You can do touch response. You could theoretically take a phone call on it as part of the pass-through speaker on Bluetooth. Also very nice. Did it work 100%? No intermittent contact for notifications uh, could not get the call routing to work or the bluetooth call answering to work properly and honestly there's nothing the only thing worse than not getting notifications is not getting them consistently so that said finally said look I, i've had all this functionality of the watch for before i do not i have lost that functionality now and i realized at that point that that active productivity that that device provided me was a benefit.
So that right. got boxed up and sent back. What did I wind up getting? I actually purchased a Watch 5 Pro. Now, somebody's probably listening to this going, well, wait, why did you buy something that as of today technically is two versions behind? Well, one, because it's still really good tech and you can get them refurbished. So I got mine for like $125, which is a quarter of what the full size prices are. Uh, second, this particular model happens to have one of the largest batteries out there. So I, I can easily do 48 hours per charge. Well, that's that threshold. That's what can make that difference. Functionality, yeah, I find it very useful in the things that it does for me. Things like reminders, things like alarms, things like calendar review. Um, all of those pieces make it an active part. And I think the thing that we, we downplay when we're looking at the active participation of a device in our productivity is how much does that device allow us to remain engaged in whatever else we're doing at that time? So if you get a notification, you get a text in, and the only thing you have is your phone, well, you have to pull your phone out, unlock it, check it, respond, whatever. If it's coming through on your watch, you can glance. And in most cases, you can glance and flick it away and just say, okay, got it, move on. You can remain engaged in what you're doing. And I think that's probably the biggest value of active productivity tech like smartwatches. If it's a passive device, the passive conversation allows you to start to say, okay, what's affecting my productivity? Is it stress? Is it heart rate? Is it poor sleep? Is it, those are all factors that you can look at and analyze, but it's not going, that thing is not going to tell you there's an issue. Now, Apple has great health software. Samsung has great health software. Google has great health software that take all that data and feed that information back. That's the active part, but the active part goes back to the phone. So, Here's the question that I think is probably the one I get most often. I want to see what your answer is. Somebody comes to you and says, should I get a smartwatch? On my quest, my first answer is, why do you want one? And, and I'm going to bring, okay, do you want one? Because you want to feel cool. Okay? And that is a valid answer. Hey, you know what? I now can spend the... 125 bucks and buy and have a digital watch that's synchronized with my phone. Great. But like anything in productivity, what is what this device will bring to you? And that will be the first question. And I understand that's not necessarily the first question you want to make. I have the money. I want to go buy it. Then you are looking for the shiny thing. Go for it, okay, get it. But the question is, what are you trying to get with and why this watch is okay, going to, to go into your life? When I get the first watch, okay, this is uh, apparently we humans don't learn. You may remember the old days of AOL, okay, when you listen to that famous jingle of, you got a mail. Okay, and at that time you were excited because you only have a friend who has mail who was geekier than you and he didn't send you anything. Okay, now if your machine, okay, you leave the beep that you got an email, okay, basically your day will be beep, 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 to do no end. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm gonna jump in there though. That's a failing on the user's part not a failing on the device part. I agree. Because we both know that almost every smartwatch out there, especially on Android and iOS, gives you the ability to control what apps will actually pass through a notification. True, true. Okay. And that is possible, okay? And mine has very limited information, but you that's very easy for me to say that the notifications on my watch are regulated. 
I teach technology. I mm. have been teaching people how to be iPad only for years. I'm studying now to teach on the personal side. I have teach this on the more professional side. And I'm starting to teach productivity on the iPhone, okay? And it's very, very, very interesting, okay? What people know, non-tech people know to do on their phone and don't know to do on their phone. And things like notification is one of them. Most people don't know. Okay, I was talking to somebody recently who uh, listened to me discuss about working with an external keyboard on the iPhone. Okay, and this person looked at me and say, "That's not possible." Bluetooth. I show her. I had a keyboard with me, so I show him how to do it. And this person was in shock. Okay, it's not a techie person. That's not. Okay, but most people, they buy the watch, okay, and learn the features that they think they need to what they can, they think the watch may or may not do for them, nothing else. And that's very interesting because we buy them, okay, and, but we don't learn how to use that technology. Okay, there is. I agree with you there. And this is where I struggle with people on this. I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. To me, it's the air fryer mentality. It's like buying an air fryer and only ever making tater tots. I mean, seriously, if somebody buys a kitchen appliance, do they not sit down and watch a bunch of YouTube videos and look at different recipes and different things they can put it to use with and figure out how to... Why do they not do the same thing with this piece of tech that is probably twice the price of that kitchen appliance and can do so many things? And it's not like the information isn't out there, whether it's, like I said, whether it's YouTube videos or whether it's productivity guys like us who can show them how to do it. The information's out there. But there's something about this that people are hesitant to say, oh, well, I just I can't figure that out. That's that's beyond. sure you can. You absolutely can. If you want to, you can. No, no. You're there. You're just going to eat tater tots. In, but he's. But you say it. Most people use tater tots. It's the same just, with the watch. OK, yeah. most people that I have look with. Apple watches, okay? They basically, as is said by default, that's how they use it. Okay, people so don't your... take the time to learn that. Then it comes Maybe... back to okay to that question: Why the watch? Yeah, that said, okay, the watch has an incredible amount of features, and you said one earlier, okay, that is key in my opinion for productivity if you know how to filter notifications okay so that's a requirement okay requirement is learn to work the notifications then if you learn to do that that is not difficult then the watch is a tool for exactly what you said and it was funny because you were saying that and i wasn't necessarily fully aware of that and a text came in Okay, of one of the few that filter that notification system. And in this in this recording, I was able to do this, read this and continue moving mm -hmm. without losing a bit. That's very powerful in the watch. And I need to I just capture it as one of the reasons to keep the watch alive. Okay, because that will not do it. The ring will not provide that. But you need to learn the basics. And that's where or what it is somehow missing in that equation. Oh, I, I agree completely. And I I think the basics start with what I was saying earlier, deciding, do I want this to be a passive device, a passive productivity tool or an active one? And if somebody's getting one for the first time, and I'm going to focus on the watch because it can do both. I, 
ring is a different conversation, uh, which just quick adjunct. I would love to see them eventually take them being the powers that be eventually take all the sensor and power capabilities and monitoring capabilities that are in the ring and put it in earbuds. But that's a Ooh, whole different conversation. That, yeah, that I, I think, will be that I will that jump would immediately be, because these things live in my ears. Yeah. And that that's the thing. I think that's a perfect opportunity. You can detect temperature. You can detect blood rate, heart rate and things like that in there. That's it. Focusing on the watch, I think if you start off with it going, okay, what are the passive things it can do for me? Plus, what's the one primary active thing that people want it to be able to do, which is to be able to pass through text messages or, or WhatsApp or whatever. If you take that base set and you master that base set and that's what you use it for, you have a good device. You have a device that is going to contribute positively to your productivity. Now, step two, to dig deeper into the active space. And this is where I'm going to, I'll answer my own question first, but I want you to think about this. What is the, the app or the tile or the feature on your watch that you use most frequently and that gives you the greatest active productivity benefit? For me, and it's really weird for me to say this because anybody who listens to the show knows this is where I struggle. It's the calendar integration. The calendar sync on the watch to my cloud-based calendar is one of the best things I have because I don't have to open my phone to go check my calendar. I don't have to go to my computer to check my calendar. It's all tied in. And it happens to be on this it happens to be through a watch face that synchronizes with Outlook. So it shows me the time, but it also shows me the calendar in Outlook mapped to it. So whatever I have mapped out in my Outlook calendar populates there to the watch face. And I can see what my time slots are taken up. Now, you don't have to use that watch face. There's, there's built-in functionality in there. But to me, that's, that's a huge benefit because, again, you stay connected to whatever you're doing. You can glance. That's what's coming up. Move on. What about you? For me, will be the timers. I do a lot of five mm -hmm. minutes here, 10 minutes here, and the timers without a doubt. And actually, I've been teaching now to clients, you know, we all need that five-minute break, okay? And for me, if I don't put a timer, those five minutes could be forever. <laughs> so, hey, it's a reality. Okay, you go back and say, mm -hmm. where the last 45 minutes went? So I've been teaching now, if you need a five-minute break, put your timer at three minutes. Okay, why? Because you put it at three minutes and two things will happen. You are ready to go back, so you didn't need the five, okay? But it's going to take you that co additional couple of minutes to be back to ready. Or you can say, you know what? Nope, I need another three. And that is fine. When you do another three, you now take six to seven minutes at the end of the day, okay, to go back. If you do blocks of five, you take 12 to 13. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't sound much, but take four breaks a day. Okay. And if you take four or five minutes break in that way, in which you did seven minutes more in each one, okay, that's half an hour of your day. It adds up at the end of the day. Same thing for the 10 minutes. Put the timer not for 10, but for eight. So you have those two minutes to go back to sit now, sip the other thing of coffee and move on. And that's where this watch win the game for me. Yeah, the the timers, I have to agree, those are a substantial one, whether it's just the on watch timer or it's tied to like the reminders capability. It being in the Samsung ecosystem, it's one of the features that I like is the fact that the reminders app that's available in Samsung ties to all the devices. So when it goes off, that reminder will go off on my tablet, my phone, my watch, whatever I'm using at any given time. And when I dismiss that reminder, it dismisses from all of them. Well, that's extremely practical. The timers piece, countdown piece, uh, 
alarms, all of those are basic. Those are active, but I think those are like cost of admission level active features that you, you want to have into place. What's a feature on your watch that you originally looked at and go, oh, this could be really helpful, tried it and never used it again? I'll tell you mine first, and then you can mm -hmm. you can tell me yours. So when I first got my watch four, I noticed that I could load an app on my watch that was integrated to Todoist. And I could have my Todoist to task list show up on my watch. I'm like, this will be amazing. I'll be able to look at my watch and know what's coming up. And, and I set it up one time, and I never used it after that. And the reason being is not that the inter the interface was bad. It's not that the functionality was bad. It was the fact that the user experience on that small of a device was far too limiting. It right. didn't make sense because as soon as I started to look at something on there, I constantly hit that ceiling of, but I need to do this with it. And it just made more sense to start it from my phone. Now, does that mean that notifications from my task manager do not come through to my watch? They absolutely do. But that's just a notification. That's a, hey, this needs to be done. And it's probably more frequent on the calendar side than it is the task one. But that was one of those features I'm like, I looked at it I'm like, oh, yeah, I can make it do this. And I never did it again. And I think that's one of the hangups that a lot of people will have when they get a smart watch is they look at this broad range of opportunities and then they realize it's like, yeah, but does it really gain me anything? What about you? Over the years, so when I get the watch, I really try to make the watch an active device. Mm -hmm. And it failed. Okay, and I try again, and I fail, and at some eventually I understood that the watch is into that category of what you call passive productivity. It is not meant to be for me to be productive on that device. Therefore, there is many things that I try at some point that you know uh, to do is how to, to watch to do it, watch must be, watch the email. You know, there were things that I tried. And in the same way that I said, I don't review email on my phone. I don't review email on my watch because I cannot do anything. Um, so there are many things that are more active in my world productivity wise that I don't even even attempt even if you ask me what is the feature I use the most on the watch Apple pay okay <laughs> that's probably okay. the feature I will bid out of anything else okay why because it's very convenient I can select the card put the watch move on with my life don't need to pull the wallet don't need to put the phone it works amazingly well do I need this device to be as effective or active as my phone or my iPad? No. Okay. And even I, and I have discussed this on the show. I have two iPads. Okay. And one of them is a more passive than the other one. And my, what mm -hmm. I mean by that is this, like this iPad mini do not have notifications. This is the device. It has access to everything. So I can do anything that I want, but it gets no notifications or get very, very minimal notification. My kids send a message, it will show in there. That's, you know, but anything that is work related, nothing of that will be in that because that's the device that I want to be able to grab and go to the corner and nobody's you know, getting my attention. This is the device for me to be with me, okay? I could be working in this device and that is fine, but it's not mm -hmm. to have notifications. The watch, same thing. The watch is for 
the things that I feel are critical for me to know, nothing else. So the number of notifications are minimal. And I, I, you basically need to earn the right to be into that list of notifications. Otherwise, no, I don't want this watch to do that. For me, the watch do Apple Pay. It beeps on calendar appointments that I have. It gives me the ability to do the timers. And that's 99% of what I do. It tracks whatever things it tracks, okay? Movement and steps and heart rate and those things. But it's a very, very passive device for me. Now, let's delve into that because I've been harping on the, the whole active part of it. I think when you look at these from a passive standpoint, and I haven't I haven't worked with one of the rings, um, I think it's interesting Samsung was talking about, and I think this is pretty standard with most of them, you actually get sent a ring sizing set first, and then you get the ring, which makes perfect sense because it has to fit properly. Uh, but from a passive standpoint and passive productivity, I love the thing. The amount of data that it gathers about my physical state of being all the time and allows me to interact with that, I find extremely helpful. And I find it in two categories. One is the sleep tracking. Absolutely. Uh, if I'm groggy the next day or I just feel off, I immediately, matter of fact, each morning, that's one of the first things I do is I check the sleep record from my previous night. You know, was I having a snoring issue? Was I too, you know, did I have a, a blood ox issue? Was, was I too cold? You know, that kind of data is captured and played back to me. The second part though, is what's called a stress monitor on it. And it measures skin response or galvanic skin response. And it tells you when you're physiologically experiencing a stress reaction to things. And when I initially got the device, I'm like, oh, yeah, how accurate can this be? I've gotten to the point where if I feel myself getting stressed and I look at the watch, yep, sure enough, it's saying you're stressed. Now, what's nice is there are functions in there to then walk you through breathing exercises and things like that. But to have that passive feedback of, yeah, this is what's going on. And at this time with this thing, this is. This is how you were feeling, and there's quantitative data to be able to reflect that. I mean, that's the type of thing that Ray just absolutely loves. This part of the equation, if you if you become the active consumer of the passive data, it can positively affect your productivity. If, however, you just collect the data and never make any adjustments or have any learnings from it, then all you're doing is collecting data and it, it's kind of useless then. Well, and it goes back to what you want that device for. Okay. The data is very useful if you are going to use it. Um, the question is, are you going to use it or not? So when we think about rings and watches and and other it's a little disappointing because samsung actually have used to have some fitness trackers that were really nice inexpensive good display solid long battery life and they just they've kind of gotten away from that uh, companies like fitbit you had companies like fossil who have stopped doing it now there's there's some i want to say one has one there are some watches out there but they've never really gotten their feet under them aside from the really big two or two big players in the space do you think they will ever become a more substantial part of the productivity environment or do you think this is always going to be a bit of a niche technology i think it's always going to be a niche fitness technology mm -hmm. They are going to improve. They are going to be, but it's really a health fitness thing. What is think is going to be in the long term. So we're talking about maybe five years, 10 years down is this will be the device you will put in your finger. Okay. And dump it in your doctor office and he will get 
your data and be able to give you a better answer. So here, here's my future prediction. You're, you're predicting on that, which I think is fascinating. I think what we're going to see at some point, and probably not, maybe not for 10 years, it's hard to say, is the combination of the flexible screen technologies we're seeing for things like the flip and the fold from Samsung, the, the future one that's going to come out from Apple, the one that's coming out from Google. We're going to see that flexible screen technology in a smaller form factor, much larger than a watch, but smaller than a phone. So kind of like kind of like the outside screen on the flip. So it's about half the half the size of an index card. In a curved format, with sensors behind it that you can wear as a cuff that provides you smartphone functionality, information data gathering on your wrist. So now you don't, it's big enough and has the battery capability and everything else. So you don't have to carry a phone and you don't have to wear a watch. They are both one in the same, but there's enough memory capability, storage and battery life to make that device practical and useful i'll i'll be curious to see i i want to see it i think it'll be cool uh, i think it'll be loaded with issues but i think it'll still be cool uh, but that's kind of where i i see this eventually going well because we will the, see one of the Sorry. one of the limitations of the watch is the physical size yep and um... We will see. AR may play a factor into this, and we will see where it goes. But I think it will will be that will be a health fitness device, never a productivity one. But but I think the data I collect, and I have arguments about this with with my doctor because she wants to make a decision based on the ten minutes she's been talking to me, and I want her to review. <laughs> all the data mm -hmm. I collect on the last 90 days. <laughs> and we have discussions about some of these things at that level, okay? And I would love for her to have the bandwidth to look at those 90 days. I get it. She don't have it. But, but it's what it is, okay? But I think that's where it's going to go to. And so we, there will, is a we will see. There is a concern. There's a uh, there's a significant privacy concern, especially yeah. around passive data gathering, uh, and who has access to that information. Many people are very concerned that that health data could then be passed along to healthcare providers and insurance companies, who could then determine are you insurable or not based on this data that's gathered through Correct. this passive device. Well, the difficulty with that, and you've seen it as well as I. The accuracy of the data is completely dependent on following the rules of how you wear the device to capture the data. So mm -hmm. you could have faulty information passed through to decision makers, which never work, works out well for anyone. So I'll, I'll be curious to see about that. Uh, the, the thing that I like and the thing I think we will continue to see, especially with devices like watches, is with... AI becoming so prevalent in so many things. The ability to leverage AI on the watch to interface with the phone, to interface, interface with the cloud, so that you don't need complicated user experiences on the watch to get access to information. You can tap it and say, what's my calendar for today? And have it show you, have it play it back to you, have it tell it to you. That's the type of thing I think really will push this to another step. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't change the fact you still have the phone as part of the equation. You still have that that smart computer in your pocket. And I don't think we're going to get away from that anytime soon. No. Which I'm actually okay with. I mean, there's well, a actually, lot of Actually, we can go in the next episode and talk more about getting more out of that phone and connected it to the devices and the visuals and getting larger screens mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You know? Yeah. But for now, follow us where you like to listen to podcasts, like us or subscribe to us and leave us a review. You can interact with us on 
personalproductivity.club. We are Gusto Pinot and Argel Wicks. See you next time on your favorite device. Don't